All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to the Pitt County Office Hour session today. I'm Aubrey Sittler. I work for APT Associates, and I'm going to start us off by going through pieces of logistical and housekeeping information before we dig into our topic today. First and foremost, as I'm sure many of you will want to know, today's session is being recorded, and the recording, along with the slides and a copy of the chat and the Q&A, will be posted to the HUD Exchange. It'll take us about two or three business days to make sure that all of those resources are accessible and to get them up onto the HUD Exchange. Uh, the link to those is on your screen now. Um, we also hope that everyone has a good audio connection, but to make sure that you have good audio, especially if you want to ask a question verbally later on in our session, we highly encourage you to connect via phone. The phone number that you can call uh, to connect to audio is on your screen here as is the access code, and we can also go ahead and put that in the chat for you too. Um, connecting by phone instead of by your computer tends to give you just a better uh, quality for your audio, both for hearing what we're saying, uh, as well as potentially asking any questions that you have over the phone later. Next, I'm gonna talk about the chat feature. We know that you all probably have a lot of questions that you'd like to ask today, and we hope that you will share those and your comments and your experiences of what's going on in your communities in the chat. Uh, the best way to do that is to use the chat. You'll see a little uh, bubble that says chat in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. If you click that, it will open up a chat pane that you can use to talk to other people in the session. We ask that you please send your messages to everyone. You'll see on your screen right now, there's a little drop down where you can pick whether you're sending to the host, to the presenter, to all panelists. Definitely use the everyone button and not all attendees. If you send it to all attendees, the panelists and the people hosting this will not see your questions. So please make sure you send to everyone um, and we will get through as many of the questions that you all ask as we can today. Finally, as I mentioned before, during the second half of our session, we will also have the opportunity for you to ask questions verbally if you want to. Uh, to tell us that you want to ask a question verbally you need to raise your hand. The hand raising feature is uh, shown in the screenshot right here from the bottom right hand of your screen, right above that chat bubble. Uh, it's a little picture of a hand. If you click that, it tells us that you would like to be unmuted. You cannot unmute yourself, but we can unmute you. Uh, so we will verbally tell you that it looks like you have your hand raised and we are about to unmute you so that you can ask your question. If you didn't mean to raise your hand or you no longer have a question, just hit that same button again and it will unraise your hand so we will know that we don't need to call on you. All right, our speakers today are going to include William Snow from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, and then three of us are on from APPS Associates, including me, Aubrey Sittler, uh, and Megan Henry, who's the director of the AHAR, uh, and Tori Morris. Um, and our agenda for today is pretty simple. We are planning to go through 2021 HIC and PIT count data submission guidance. Um, just gonna outline everything that was in the data submission guidance that was published earlier this week, and then we'll go into Q&A uh, for you all to ask your questions about submitting your PIT and HIC data for 2021. With that, I will go ahead and hand things over to William. All right. Thanks, Aubrey. Welcome to everyone. Looking forward to today's conversation. Uh, feels like we've kind of had a long journey with the 2021 point in time counts. Uh, didn't get data or information out on how to count until last November. Then we were back and forth as the surge went as high as it could through January, like who's going to count, who's not going to count. We had waiver options. Uh, lots of COCs decided that they were going to do some form of counts, although not everyone is, and that's fine due to safety. And so, uh, it raises all sorts of questions about how you finally submit the data, uh, depending on what you did. So today, we're going to walk through some of those pieces, probably not every single detail that folks want, but we will uh, try to address as many questions as we can. Uh, and from there, hopefully you'll be able to go ahead and submit. So next slide, please. So we were able to publish guidance. Hopefully this actually answers most of the questions that you have. This guidance walks through the normal HCX data submission process with uh, some carve out for those who did partial unsheltered point in time counts. So um, I think one way to think of this, and we'll talk about this more in the training, 
is to try to think about what's different this year to last. For many communities, uh, there's a lot that's the same. So one of the biggest, um, I guess, burdens of reporting on this is the HIC. The HIC is relatively unchanged. We'll talk about a few nuances uh, that are largely about how do I report the data I have. It's not, um, it's not different in HDX. You just need to know, like, how do I categorize this in HDX? So that, thankfully, is largely the same. Uh, the shelter point time count, everyone was expected to do that. Uh, that's the same. Uh, if you did an unsheltered point in time count, a normal uh, count where you collect the data on everyone, uh, there is a way to report just as you have in the past. Uh, I should note that if you were one of the COCs that were approved to use an alternate data set, I think in nearly, if not all of those circumstances, the COC said that they were going to collect all of the unsheltered data elements, then you would submit your data as if it were a full unsheltered count. So I know I, I saw a few questions around that. You would be uh, in that camp. So your data submission is as it has been in the past. Uh, but there are a lot of you who did some form of unsheltered point in time count that was smaller, uh, smaller in size, still a lot of effort for all of you, uh, and you need to know, like, well, how do I submit if I didn't have all of the elements? That's what this is all about, and the guidance walks through a lot of that. So please take time to look at that. There's lots of screenshots, uh, lots of things to help you kind of see your way through the submission. Uh, remember, this is going to be an HDX 1.0 still. Uh, that's where we're submitting this data. And let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so the one element that we did change in the housing inventory this year was one of the federal funding sources. We just wanted to know if you're uh, in a project that is receiving ESG CB funding. If so, then yes, on the funding source. Uh, and you'll have the option of saying whether it was rapid rehousing or emergency shelter. If you are a temporary emergency shelter funded project or have that in your COC, that also would be reported as emergency shelter. We don't have a special carve out for temporary emergency shelter in the reporting. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so there are three areas that involve VA funded projects. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time on those. Again, you're, we're not really changing the nature of the reporting. Um, you'll use existing frameworks, but you need some guidance on what that means, right? How do you do that? So this is what uh, those things are. I'm going to start with the SSVF Emergency Housing Assistance Program. So this is actually a carve out within the SSF or SSVF program, which is normally exclusively rapid rehousing. So in the HIC in the past, if you said SSVF, you had to report it as rapid rehousing. However, they actually have an arm, especially under COVID, where they report the, uh, or where they're able to serve people through SSVF in hotels or some form of emergency shelter. Again, I think they're almost always hotels. So there were enough of those. In fact, I think the ballpark figure was around 10,000 people, veterans, were served through EHA emergency shelter uh, or this kind of uh, or hotel option. So we want to be able to capture that data. So how do you do that? Well, in the HICS, you're going to report people in those hotels or in those emergency beds as shelter. They'll be treated not as year-round, but as overflow beds. So again, your year round should show up as zero and the funding source will be SSVF. So remember, normally you're only allowed to report SSVF beds as rapid rehousing, so you will get an error. It's not, a, not an all stop, it's just a warning. And you'll have to say, yes, I understand this is SSVF. It was EHA funded SSVF and, and that's how it'll be reported. So next slide, please. There are two options for how to get this data out. In your local setup, uh, it depends how you set it up in HMIS. It's also possible you didn't set it up in HMIS. So really, there's a third option where you don't have to worry about, like, how do I pull this out of HMIS? You just say, well, uh, I talked to 
the SSVF provider. This number of people were in EHA on the night of the point in time count, and you'll report this such based on the guidance in the last slide. So, your HMIS project setup will determine kind of the nuance you have to follow through to get your EHA beds appropriately accounted for in the HITS uh, and how you'll pull it from HMIS. So, I'm actually going to take the second bullet on here first. The easiest scenario is you may have just set up an EHA program in HMIS and set it up as shelter. If you did that, your life is easy. You essentially pull those out. They're HMIS participating beds. You'll report the EHA uh, units as part of that project, and you move forward. Uh, we know that there are many COCs that didn't do that. You weren't required to do that. You could, in fact, just report it as part of uh, or collect the data in your normal SSVF rapid rehousing project. So we needed a way to kind of pull that piece out of, uh, of your data so that you could report the shelter side of it. So the first thing to recognize is that those would be reported as non-HMIS participating, um, and you'll have to make sure you pull out the HMIS project ID. We have a little bit of guidance here. So in our heads, we're thinking about what's gonna come, not just for your HIC reporting this year, but your impact on LSA later. So this should make your life a little bit easier if you follow this guidance around project ID in particular, right? So use the project ID associated with the project in HMIS, but you want to probably put an addendum on that says EHA or something to call out that project ID because you're essentially going to duplicate that ID, one for the emergency shelter piece and one for the SSVF piece. Um, let's go in, actually, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and this slide will kind of walk through, so who exactly, how am I going to know if they're set up as a rapid rehousing project, how am I going to know who exactly is part of the EHA portion that should be reported in the HIC and, and beds included? So what you'll do is you'll walk through uh, this kind of logic here that's on the screen. You'll start with everyone who's in the project, and then you apply two uh, pieces or two filters to that. One, do they have a move-in date? If there is no rapid rehousing move-in date, or move-in date period associated with record, then you keep drilling down, right? So if they have a move-in date, then they're in rapid rehousing, they're not in EHA, do not count them. So if there is no moving date, next filter is, do they have an existing EHA TFA service recorded for the month? I have to admit, I don't know what TFA uh, stands for. So we'll put that in there. Uh, Temporary that, financial that's... assistance. Oh, thank you. Temporary financial assistance. If that's recorded, uh, then that will tell you exactly which persons in that rapid rehousing project should be reported as part of EHA, and, and those should be included in your housing inventory account. So everyone who's in that EHA record, again, regardless of how you pull it, they're all considered under emergency shelter, so they'll be reported as part of the sheltered point in time count. Uh, it's possible that and likely that you won't have much information about the beds associated with them, it is okay just to say one person equals one bed for that, and you'll have 100% uh, utilization associated with it as well. So again, we know there are some nuance. We don't want to make it more complicated than it has to be. We know this already has some layers to it of complication, um, but for things like, again, that last part, we get that you may not know the beds. So just use the people as a proxy for that and report that number of beds accordingly. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what about GPD? Uh, GPD, like some of our other shelters, some GPD did a form of decompression where uh, they use hotel motels to allow some folks to spread out or they temporarily house people uh, in hotel motel during the night of the counts count them as if they were in the GPD program in the facility itself. So no unique reporting there. You're not going to treat them as sheltered. You're not going to have to create another record for that. Just include them as part of the count uh, and as part of the count of that existing GPD program. So we know there were a lot of variations like that. There was a lot of that anyways with how you reported or will report uh, some of your existing shelters that are not uh, GPD funded or um, 
or some of the other, especially in relation to non-congregate shelters. So that's that's our uh, guidance on that. So next slide, please. HUD Bash. So we were thrilled to release the HUD Bash tool and have worked with our partners in the VA to get the data. Uh, we also know that it wasn't perfect. And this is round one, so lots of lessons learned as we tried to get the first round of data into your HMIS in time to report for the HIC. One of the biggest areas of question that we've received is, uh, what do I do when I, all I have is veteran data? I don't have anything on their household or household composition, times you don't have anything on the bed or the number of units. So this is what you'll do in that case, if you don't have any of the other information, simply report the number of veterans. You can, well, you will need to report them as under the household category of households with only adults or without children. Um, that's the household that you'll count them under. And uh, if you don't have the bed information, this is similar to what we just said with EHA, it's one veteran equals one bed equals one unit. So you'll treat it like that. Uh, we, again, don't want to force you to jump through a lot of hoops to kind of guess. We know that this may make some of your numbers look a little different from last year. Uh, thankfully, this is not part of the point in time count, so it doesn't have implications uh, on your counts going up or down. So that's really important. And in the past, in the most recent past, we haven't used your total number of PSH beds as a way of scoring. Uh, we haven't done that for several years now, and we don't anticipate it for the future. So that's another area where that's, that's something where we will make sure we're not causing harm by, by making this decision. We just thought this would be the easiest for you to implement and require the least amount of work. And you're getting more data. Getting more data in HMIS, that's good, right? Overall, that should actually improve your ability to analyze the system, improve your ability to report and understand what's going on. We're all for that gain. We don't mean to cause more um, more pain, but again, we know it's, it's imperfect uh, and we're uh, willing to kind of accept that to get more of the data for this. So that's a lot of things. Again, the VA stuff is great. We're excited that actually so much flexibility was there for the various things I talked about, um, but also recognize that, that there's also complications with that as well. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Aubrey to kind of walk through the HCX side of submitting. Great, thank you, William. All right, so um, in order to support all of these changes for 2021, especially around unsheltered hit count changes, we had to do a lot of reprogramming of the HDX. Um, so thank you for your patience and waiting for HDX to be open for data submission. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and walk us through, as William said just now, a lot of the changes that you'll see from what you may have noticed in prior years for what HDX looks like in order to account for the types of unsheltered pit counts that people were allowed to do this year. So first and foremost, we've gotten some AOQs about this. I want to remind folks that on this homepage, when you first enter your pit count date and the type of shelter um, pit count that you conducted this year, it has always said, did you receive a HUD waiver, received HUD waiver? This question has always been there. And what it is referring to is whether or not you got a HUD waiver to conduct your pit count outside of the last 10 days of January. Once you enter your pit count date and select your type of pit count and hit save in the HDX, that question will go away if you conducted your pit count within the last 10 days of January. If you did not conduct your pit count in the last 10 days of January, then you do need to answer that question to tell um, HUD, whether or not you got, got a waiver in the way that the notice requires you to if you're going to conduct your pit count outside the last 10 days of January. But again, this is not referring to the memo, uh, the CPD memo that had certain unsheltered pit count waivers available. There were also changes that we implemented for the type of pit count that you conducted this year, and I'm going to walk through each one of the ones that is now available. The first one is super easy. It's the sheltered only pit count, and that has always been available as an option. There are many COCs that every other year do not conduct an unsheltered pit count. The functionality of saying that you only conducted a sheltered pit count is the same as it would be in any other year. So if you did not collect and are not going to report on any unsheltered pit count data, you want to select this first option, which is sheltered only count, uh, and then you will only submit sheltered pit count data. You won't submit any unsheltered pit count data. 
The second option is sheltered and full unsheltered count. And this replaces the option that used to be called sheltered and unsheltered count. Since there were multiple types of unsheltered counts this year, we had to differentiate between them. So sheltered and full unsheltered count is what you would have done in any other year that you had conducted both a sheltered and an unsheltered PIP count. Um, so what this means is that you are accounting for your entire geography. It means that you are reporting on demographics and other data elements, chronic status, subpopulation data, additional population data, household type for everybody who is counted. Um, and in the same way that you would in other years, if you have any missing data, it means that you are extrapolating for that data to account for all people within your COC. That is what the sheltered and full unsheltered count option means. Sheltered and partial unsheltered count is the third and final option, and it is new this year, and there are several different ways in which the functionality of the HDX has been altered to allow for the range of partial pit counts that people um, had the permission to conduct uh, from HUD this year. So what it means if you did a partial unsheltered pit count is that you collected some, but not all of the usual required unsheltered data elements. Please note that it does not mean that you only covered part of your ge geography or part of your population. You still must have used a methodology that meets HUD standards for covering your full geography and population, but without some data elements. For example, maybe you just did a head count of total number of people in your COC. Maybe you only collected on some demographic. Maybe you collected everything except for chronic homeless status for people. Anything short of the full unsheltered count qualifies as a partial unsheltered count. Now, in the HDX, once you have selected that third option of sheltered and partial unsheltered count, it tells the HDX to change the way that you interact with the unsheltered data um, within um, particularly the totals tables. So, in this screenshot here, you can see that we are in the all populations tab. You've selected sheltered and partial unsheltered pit count. And we are in the totals table. If you're doing a full unsheltered pit count, you cannot edit the totals table at all. But because you're doing a partial unsheltered pit count, if you do not have household data, um, you don't know whether there were children in households, you just have a total head count, you just don't have any ages for people, you need to be able to edit this totals um, table instead. So you do have the capability to edit this table. But please note that if you are editing the total table, it's gonna delete the data that you have put in the household breakdown tab. So if you are reporting by household type, put those data in first and then don't touch the totals table. This is also true in the veterans totals table tab. Normally you can only add information into each of the household types within the veteran category. So um, household, veteran households, at least one adult and one child, uh, veteran households without children, and then those auto calculate your totals in the totals table. Um, for this year's partial unsheltered pit count functionality, you can edit the totals table if you are not reporting on how, by household type. Um, you also have the capacity when you're doing a partial unsheltered count to edit this field that um, you can see highlighted in the unsheltered column here within each household type. Um, so it's the total number of persons. Because many people were not collecting age information to report, this number is normally auto-calculated based on um, the number of people reported by the ages below it. If you are not reporting by age, leave those fields blank for ages 18 to 24 and ages or people over 24 in this example, which is households without children, and instead just put a total number of persons here. Um, please, know, if you have incomplete information about this, still leave it blank. We will not include any information that does not sum to the total. We will always assume that the total number reported is the correct number. And again, we're not doing partial data. Um, there are a couple of functionalities related to color coding that are going to help you and us identify uh, where people have and can edit unsheltered data fields. So some of these will look familiar, three of them in fact, because they are the same as prior years. Any field that's white, you can edit. So you'd be able to click where this zero is, you'd be able to delete it, you'd be able to add some other number in. Uh, you can manually enter and change those. 
The light blue fields are total fields that have been manually calculated, so they are not automatically calculated. You have manually put in this 122 that's right here in this light blue field. Um, the gray fields that have numbers in them have been automatically calculated from other manually entered data, and you cannot edit anything that's gray, whether it has a number in it or not. Um, if you see a field that is gray and has this blue line on the right side of it, that means that this field would be editable, but it's not because a relevant field in another table has been manually changed. Uh, if you hover over this in the HDX uh, with your mouse, it will tell you why it cannot be edited. And we'll, I'll show you some examples of screenshots in just a second for how those, these things kind of interact with each other. And finally, if there are any fields that are just blank and they're gray, it means that they cannot be edited because another field in the same column has been manually edited. All right, so an example of um, some of these fields. So I mentioned earlier that this total number of persons uh, box, the one that's currently light blue and says 122 in this screenshot, if you did a full unsheltered count, that box would be grayed out with a number that would be automatically calculated based on the number of people that you put by age below it. So if you put 10 people under 18, 10 people 18 to 24, 10 people over age 24, it would add up to 30 and you would not be able to change that 30. This year, if you don't know the ages of the people in households with at least one adult and one child, but you do have a head count by household type, you would wanna put that number here uh, where you see that 122 and it turns blue to tell you, hey, you edited this, that's why these other boxes below it are gray. Now, this is a, the second example is, it spills over onto the next slide, but we're gonna start with uh, these highlighted boxes uh, that are that are gray with a blue line on the right-hand side. It's the unsheltered column, it's households without children for all homeless populations, and all of the boxes are grayed out for total number of persons and number of persons by age. But they're grayed out with this blue box, which tells you, oh, you would normally be able to edit these, but you can't because they've been edited somewhere else. If you, I'm gonna go to the next slide. If you go over to the totals table within that same all homeless populations tab, you can see this, again, it's a light blue box with a number in it, which means it was manually edited and it's a totals field. You have put a total number of people counted in your unsheltered pit count here is 473. Because you edited that field in the totals table, you cannot edit the total number of persons shown in other tables. And you cannot add people by age below that because again, otherwise it would auto calculate. Um, it's an either or, you can't do both. If you accidentally edit something that you need to go back and delete and you're like, oh shoot, no, I did have the breakdown by household or I did have the breakdown by age. All you have to do is highlight that 473, hit delete and then tab out of it or enter out of it. Uh, and it'll free up those boxes for editing again. It's a little finicky, it's different from, it's, from how it's ever been before, but I promise uh, you get used to it. And again, we have all of this written down in the data submission guidance to kind of help guide um, your use in the HDX and the AAQ is always open to answer questions as you're working through this functionality. For those of you who only did a head count and you're not adding any demographic data whatsoever, this is the field that you want to edit. It's the total number of persons in the totals tab of the all homeless populations tab. Um, this is the only number that you need to add in if you are only reporting a total headcount of people, again, with no household breakdown, no age, no chronic status, no demographics, just that field. We are also asking you to please leave other fields blank. Don't put zeros in, delete them and, and leave them blank if you did not collect data within a specific demographic or um, other type of field. Um, this reiterates a lot of what we have already, or what I've already mentioned um, in other slides and in context, but as a reminder, um, if you completed a partial unsheltered count, please enter complete demographics that sum to the total number of people reported in that column or leave them blank. Again, you're not gonna be submitting, if you have 100 total people counted and you only know the race of 50 of them, you either need to have used a methodology that allows you to extrapolate for the total to, to be reporting on race for 100 people or not reporting on race at all. 
If any of your demographic or other data do not sum to the total of those columns that I just mentioned, um, you, it will not be used. We will just, again, assume that any of the total number of people reported by category um, is the correct number. And if the demographics don't sum to that, if added together, they don't equal that total number, then we are assuming that uh, you will not be including demographic data in your pit count submission. We also created this table for you um, to help crosswalk what, uh, if you're doing an unsheltered, a partial unsheltered count, this sort of summary of validations of what needs to equal what if you're going to include it. Um, this row A is a pretty important one. And as, you'll, as you see in these other uh, boxes, these other cells, a lot of them link back to things in row A, so pay attention to that. Um, but basically how you read this is uh, each row is a different type of data. So total persons, demographic, chronic status, and additional population. And each column is a different type of tab or table. Um, and so when you are submitting any of these types of data in any of these places, this tells you uh, what it should equal or what it cannot exceed. So for example, if you look at row C, column two, any chronic status data that you are entering into all homeless populations tabs, the household level tables, any of the data that's entered into chronic status cannot exceed your full head count, which is 1A, or it cannot exceed any entered data, or it cannot exceed the total number of people entered into that household type. I know that was a lot of information, and we are now moving into our Q&A. So let me go ahead. I know we've got a bunch of questions that people have asked about what William presented on and about kind of the HDX functionality for this year. Um, all right. So our first question that I'm going to ask is, what if we have a total number of unsheltered people and we know that some people are in families, but we are not sure about the others? Should we report the data on the household types that we do know about? William, do you want to answer we, that one? I think we have guidance on that from the past in our in our notice about how to address uh, kind of the incomplete data when it comes to distribution among household types. Uh, generally, you have that option of uh, kind of talking about what you just posited there of extrapolating that amount as long as you have no data that contradicts that. Right? If you have, if you're not extrapolating a min shelter. To, to family data is definitely don't want to do that. But if you have like data, you certainly have the ability to uh, use that like data to extrapolate to account for uh, missing information. Great. Thanks, Liam. Can I submit partial demographic data? So it's a little unclear what that means. Uh, if you mean partial demographic data in the sense that I have all of the data on race for all persons in my unsheltered count, and that may mean I had to extrapolate to account for them, yes, you can provide race and ethnicity data and not gender data, something like that, right? If, if partial means not every element, but, uh, but it means you account for every person in your count with that, uh, for each of the elements you do have, then that's okay. It's just not acceptable to say, well, I only did 50% of the people, so can I just sub uh, submit 50%, submit the data based on the 50%? No, you're going to have to account for everyone. So either you'll have to extrapolate to account for everyone uh, so that 100% of folks are covered by with race data, whichever element, or you can choose if you don't have confidence in that. Uh, this is a year where you could choose to submit less. We need to look and consider whether you got waiver approval. I think everyone who needed to get waiver approval to do something less did. Uh, if you're concerned about that, you can submit an AAQ and we can we can handle that. But just know, to Aubrey's point earlier, uh, partial only means partial elements. It never means partial part of the population. You always have to submit the data on the entire population if you choose to submit uh, any given element. Great, thank you, William. Um, we've got a number of SSVF questions that have come in. 
uh, let's go ahead and move through a few of those. So, there are a few that I think are all asking similar questions about HDX and SSBF. So several people have said, you know, in HDX, it's going to give us an error if we use the same HMIS project ID for SSBF EHA as we are using for SSBF rapid rehousing. How do we deal with that? Aubrey, do you want to answer that? You're probably better suited for that. I can, yes. So, one of the, in the data submission guidance and in the slide that William presented earlier, we are highly recommending that people do something consistent um, to account for the HMIS project ID for the EHA um, project in the HIC. And so, this is specifically for folks who do not have EHA set up as its own um, project in HMIS. It is not a requirement to set up SSCF EHA as an emergency shelter project in HMIS. Some people have, which is why we have to speak to both. But if um, it is the rapid rehousing project service transaction that accounts for EHA and HMIS, and it is not an emergency shelter project in HMIS, what we are recommending that you do for that project ID in the HIC is to use the same project ID as the rapid rehousing program with a hyphen EHA on the end of it. So it, it's not a project ID that actually shows up in your HMIS, but it tells you and it tells us that, hey, this is a project that is linked to the actual number at the beginning of this, or the actual code at the beginning of this, but the hyphen EHA says, this is SSVF EHA, which is why it doesn't exist in HMIS. Um, we are also you know, planning for that to be helpful on the LSA front later on uh, when you are doing your next round of data submission for that. So you're correct, so you can't have an identical HMIS project ID in the HIC for both the rapid rehousing and the EHA project if they're in fact the same project in HMIS, but you can kind of add that sort of coding to the end of it to say, this is EHA. So that's what we're recommending that you do. Um, we, okay, so someone else has asked, we already set up non-participating emergency shelter projects for these EHA projects and beds. Um, are you saying that we should not do that and instead use the SSBF HMIS ID? I hope that the answer I just gave speaks to that. If you chose a different path for assigning a project ID, that's fine. Um, it, you just need to be, be able to remember that later on for your own benefit um, and for, I believe, LSA purposes as well. Does that seem right, William? Anything else to add to that? That sounds right. And you're hearing a theme here. We're trying to address six questions and pit questions, but we also know, like, to answer questions today, you're, we also are trying to answer questions you're going to have in a year, well, in nine months, I guess, on the LSA, right? We, we'd rather set this up now so that we don't surprise you later by saying, oh, yeah, if you'd done it slightly differently in May or April, you would have had a lot less trouble now. No, we're trying to give you those hints, so just look at how you are set up. Uh, consider the easiest way to submit, right? If you have a separate project already set up for EHA, use that, but recognize if it's non-HMIS participating, that's gonna come up as a flag in, in the future, in the, the LSA, so you need to flag that and be prepared to kind of speak to that in a several months. So the way you kind of manage that now, is we leave that up to you, but we wanna flag it so you're aware. That's gonna come up. So how are you gonna be able to address those questions? So we'll, we'll keep speaking to that as we address questions here. We just want, again, no surprises when the LSA comes up. We want you to be prepared now. It may even change how you report in the HIC because it may make your life uh, slightly more difficult today, uh, but save you a lot more, uh, a lot of grief down the road. And that's kind of our goal. Yeah, thanks for that, William. I think the notion of trying to be thoughtful and planful and support everyone and being thoughtful and planful is certainly has been a theme of this year's uh, 2021 Pit and Hick data submission. Um, okay, next SSBF question. For the EHA, what are we putting in the HIC for this? If we don't have a project, then the HIC and the Pit data will not match for emergency shelter. I think that the gist of this question might be, how do we make sure that um, the Pit count and the HIC are matching to account for SSBF EHA? Yeah, do you want to keep going on that? I think, again, Aubrey, you're probably most suited for that. Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, if you are putting an emergency shelter project in for SSBF EHA, 
then the people who you're counting there also need to go into your sheltered pit count. Um, and you should have all access to all of the demographic information that you would need, all of the chronic status, et cetera, um, to be able to report on that. Um, so there is still an expectation that those two numbers, both the number of people counted in emergency shelter projects in the HIC, as well as the number of people counted as in emergency shelter on the night of the pit count, um, should align. Um, yeah, okay. a few questions about rapid rehousing, so I'll take those while you look at other SSDF ones. Go for ones, it. Maybe. There are a few questions around how do you report somebody in rapid rehousing, right? Like, where do you report them? So, uh, if the person is enrolled in rapid rehousing but not yet housed, right, no move-in date, uh, presumably that person is homeless, so you will report that person as homeless and you'll report them uh, in the appropriate category. Often we tend to see them in shelter or they're uh, accounted for elsewise, but without the move-in date, they're not housed. So yes, you need to report those people and you need to report them as homeless. And the minute they have that move-in date, they're not gonna show up in your shelter at point in time count because we consider them permanently housed at that point. So the move-in date is the trigger for uh, how you report people in the rapid rehousing. Uh, I also saw questions around rapid rehousing, like what numbers you report in terms of total beds. Uh, rapid rehousing has always been kind of a fun one and it generally is what do you have on the night of the count. Most of the time what you have is a reflection of vouchers issued, people and households in vouchers, there are still some rapid rehousing programs where they have kind of a stock more, that looks a little more like transitional housing, right? Where they have X number of beds out at a point in time, um, perhaps not all filled, that's kind of rare, but it is possible. So the HIC continues to be what is available as opposed to what's occupied. So you should always report what's available. But again, rapid rehousing tends to be what is occupied and available is one and the same thing because you don't tend to have some sort of set of open units out there. Uh, they tend to be tied, again, to vouchers that are already on the street. Great. Uh, Thanks, I'm going to jump, Aubrey, I'm going to jump in one second. I, I think um, just okay. to clarify from the, the data quality perspective for rapid rehousing, what the HDX and what the data quality team will be looking for after the fact is sort of confirming if that people in beds for rapid rehousing are the same, and if they're not the same, why? So that's sort of um, just to make it clear that we it's expected that it will be a one person per bed. Thanks for that, Megan. Always helpful to hear. Um, Daniela, we are going to go ahead and unmute you. It looks like your hand is raised. Thank you, you so much. You should be unmuted if you want to ask your question. Yes, Thank I can you hear you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of questions, but I think most of them have been answered in one way or another. Um, just to clarify, so in my, uh, in our CSDR balance of state, I should say, we did a partial and sheltered count. Uh, we have multiple regions, so we did a partial and sheltered, and sheltered count. And also some regions opted to conduct an observation, like a head count. Um, so we have numbers both from um, headcount observation type of surveys and also from um, partial and shelter surveys. So we were able to capture um, demographics with those surveys, but with the with the headcount, we were only able to capture the number of people. Um, so would you mind just clarifying how should I go about reporting these numbers? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I'm gonna put a little plug in. We are gearing up to release a tool to help with this. It's a little bit late in the game, so many of you probably won't use it, but it, it will help for uh, this situation and hopefully for the future. Uh, the way we look at it is, it depends on how comprehensive the data you do have is. So mm -hmm. if your observations are 90% of your data, I would tell you the only thing you're going to submit in that scenario is a headcount. So you'll have that other data. You can use it for local purposes, but I would not recommend even attempting to extrapolate that data to kind of account for the rest of the geography. If that's flipped and you have 
let's say 60% of your data is associated with uh, the shorter interview where you have some mm -hmm. of the data and 40% is the observation, you know, at that point you, you can decide whether you want to make that extrapolation. Uh, it's mm -hmm. probably okay to do so. We prefer a little bit higher, but you know, like that's, that's uh, your call and it's probably mm -hmm. an okay range for you to do it as long as you're confident that the data you're extrapolating, like those areas are fairly representative mm -hmm of the areas you're extrapolating to account for. We generally say kind of look at and create strata, right? Create groups of like mm -hmm. COTs and look at how, uh, how the data you have relates to the data you don't have in those groups and make the mm -hmm. decision from, but that's complicated too. Like I, I'm not gonna lie and say, hey, that's really easy. Just sit down and make some strata and do some extrapolation, mm -hmm. right? Like that does not sound yeah. like a nice uh, Friday, na uh, Friday afternoon activity. So. Just consider what you have, and it is okay, especially if you conducted a full count last year. It's okay mm -hmm. for you to say, look, I just don't have confidence in the larger set. I'm just going to do the head count. Okay. And uh, you said, thank you so much for that. That, that makes sense. If I, uh, on the other hand, if the surveys represented 90% of my data, then I would only report on those surveys, correct? No, you would still account for the 10% that were observed by uh, extrapolating. Uh, so you'd use that 90% to say, okay, well, I, you're still gonna have to kind of break it out of the groups and extrapolate for the missing areas uh, based on that, that 90%. So one way or another, I would need to extrapolate based on, on what I have from headcount and from uh, surveys. Yeah. That's yeah, exactly one, right. If you have 90% of the surveys, there's an extrapolation tool that's on the HUD exchange, I believe. Is, uh, is that, that um, Excel spreadsheet? It is. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. And it only asks that you have 80% of the data. So that's really sort of the benchmark that we've been using is if you have demographic data on 80% of your population, we can be pretty confident that the extrapolation tool will get you very close to there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if you only have 10% of the demographic data, it, as William had mentioned, it'd be really hard to get an accurate picture. Um, so it would be easiest for you to just enter the total numbers that you have. Okay, and that, sorry, that would be the total numbers for the, from the surveys, if, if most of my information is coming from the surveys, correct? Oh, if most of your information is coming from the surveys, then particularly if it's 80% or above, then certainly use the extrapolation tool and you can combine your, your survey-based counts and your observation-based counts assuming that the 20% the is the um, observation-based counts. If you have 80% or more, or you know, sort of a good chunk is just coming from observations, mm -hmm. I would just combine your survey-based counts with your observation head counts and just report on those total number of people. Okay. Instead of that adding any demographics at all. Yeah. Okay. Um... Thank you so much. I definitely don't want to take a whole lot of time, but may I ask um, just a follow-up question from the extrapolation tool? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this extrapolation tool right now. Uh, would I, it seems like it's a very similar format to what we report on HTX, um, and that's my only concern. Uh, I do have a spreadsheet that mimics the, the, the where we report on HDX, uh, but would I use the extrapolation tool to to enter those numbers on HDX? Yep, you'd use the extrapolated numbers based on what you pull from the tool mm -hmm. to do that. So we created the tool to mirror what's in HDX so that you could easily say, oh, this is this is what I'm gonna have to report, right? And this is the same format. So yeah, use the, the numbers as extrapolated in the tool uh, and report those in HDX. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that so much. Thank you. Yeah, always feel free and everyone else as well. When you've got super specific questions, you're not sure as you go, submit an AAQ and um, you'll get um, some support and some responses for what the expectations are. Um, we've got a number of questions, William, about changes in capacity uh, to different shelter projects in particular during COVID. Um, so let's go ahead and ask some of those questions to get them out there. So one person has said 
for changes to emergency shelter capacity due to COVID, should we enter only the number of beds that were available on the night of the pit count, even though that is significantly different than previous years? All right. I'm actually going to try to couple, cover a couple things at once here, because this was, we anticipated there was going to be lots of questions on this. So I will tell you, HMIS setup is probably going to drive most of this. Right, so in our minds, we, our goal was to not like ruin your life with all sorts of data nuance as COVID was hitting. We provided HMIS setup guidance, uh, I wanna say last April, and that's gonna be the core for how we respond to this. So you have a couple of options here. Uh, first, if you're a shelter that had 100 beds before COVID hit and you decompressed, and nothing else happened, right? You didn't create other units, like you simply decompressed and you went down to 50 beds. You're gonna report 50 beds, that's it. Like that's, that's what we would like you to do is report on exactly what's available on the night of the count. Now, what we often saw was uh, shelters worked in a system and they rarely did something that was like all tied to them. And, and often what happened was, well, we decompressed shelter A and we opened shelter B to compensate for that decompression. So whereas shelter A had 100 beds at one point, now it has 50, but we opened up a hotel to cover the other 50 people. If that's the case, we essentially gave you the option of setting up another shelter uh, in HMIS and recording that hotel set of beds, and then you would report your shelter as 50 beds, the decompressed shelter, and you would report uh, the 50 beds associated with the hotel because it's already set up as a separate project. You had another option of simply saying, look, we moved people to 50 hotel rooms, but it was really part of the same service package that's in our shelter. It was the same staff serving them. They were just spread out more to account for COVID needs. Uh, so it's more or less the same shelter just spread out. You had the choice then just to say, we are one shelter. And you would report that as one. Uh, if your HMIS setup is one shelter in that case, you can continue to report it as one shelter in spite of the fact that you have 50 beds spread out now. Uh, and you wouldn't have to report those in some sort of strange nuance. You would just consider it all facility-based emergency shelter. So you don't have to account for them as being hotel-based or anything like that. Again, that's more for the ease of reporting for you. Now, if you increase capacity through the hotel. So let's say you didn't uh, add 50 new hotel beds, you added 100 new hotel beds and you still had your shelter that's 50. In that case, we recommended that you create a new shelter uh, or new record in HMIS because you're actually not really just changing uh, the location of beds in a shelter, you're actually creating capacity. So it's really a new shelter at that point. So in those cases, we would expect that you would have a separate shelter project in HMIS, and that's what you would report. In all of those cases, you were really reporting your bed in the shelter based on the night of the hit. Now, we do understand that there are some scenarios where that's complicated or may not be possible due to maybe HMIS setup. If you decompress and for some reason you can't show those numbers as, uh, as being less, if you report them as, let's say, 100 beds, but you're really operating as 50, it will show as heavily underutilized, right? You'll still only report 50 people in those beds. Uh, that's allowable, but I will tell you that that's the type of thing that will have LSA implications down the road, right? Because you're going to have to account for what was going on in the shelter on the night of the count. And I wish it were as easy as saying, well, COVID happened, and I write the note, and I'm done. Uh, that's that's simply not how the LSA cleanup happens, and you guys are very, very well aware of that. So I would recommend that you reflect the actual capacity on the night of the count. It'll make your life easier in the long run uh, if you take that approach. Uh, Aubrey or Megan, is there a scenario that we miss there that we see in the questions? I think you hit on most of the things that people were asking about in terms of decompression and hotel muscle beds. I think the only other one that is like a very specific question that will probably be useful for many people on the phone is we have a few motel voucher projects that did not have any clients on the night of the count. Do we include these projects on the HIC 
because they were technically available, even though they're considered over, overflow beds and therefore don't have a set number of beds? Mm, that's a really great question. So I would say you don't need to report them. They are overflow and overflow. We don't make you uh, uh, report if it's not open on the night of the count. You have some flexibility there. I will just say, uh, for instance, we've allowed for rapid rehousing projects. If you have zero beds on the night of the count, we've allowed you to report that because it's used for other reporting purposes, right? You use it for strategic planning. That may be possible, but I actually would recommend not including the project at all in that case. Does that sound right to you, Aubrey and Megan? I think that's consistent with our guidance. That sounds right to me. I just have one quick question, um, just to clarify, because if so, if it's a decom, so if a if a, a, a project with 100 beds decompresses and and 20 of those beds go to um, hotel motel availability. In the case that they're occupied, we have them not touch a thing, right? So we say, um, your inventory stays the same, um, keep it as it is. Um, but if they did that, but those beds weren't occupied, but it's sort of just on the night of the count, that's where I'm sort of, um, it might be that it just, you have to figure out what what feels right um, to you as, as the community, what, what makes the most sense. Yeah, that's a great point. Because you have some discretion in this regard, and no matter what, your shelter in that case is decompressed. So you may want to reflect the available beds through the hotel, uh, but circumstances may dictate that they weren't actually available too, right? Like those are things that I can make a policy here in Washington, D.C. that doesn't make any sense for you. you. You have a little bit of discretion to kind of think through, were they actually available? Should I include them and count them? Um, you should know, and there's, there's kind of an implied question in a lot of this of like, are we going to get penalized? Are, are you comparing last year's shelter capacity to this year's shelter capacity? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Like COVID is a mess. The data is a mess from all of this, and we know that. Uh, I actually think the HIC is going to tell us a lot of the messiness, but I think there's a really strong and positive message in that, in, uh, in how communities responded, how you responded to this crisis. So we're gonna use that mess and we know there's a lot floating in that data. Uh, I would recommend that you just reflect as accurate as possible. And again, use your discretion uh, as to what that means locally, but don't, uh, don't worry about being penalized because one shelter is 50 last year and 10 this year. Like we're not we're not looking to penalize you or there's no gotcha here. We want to know what happened. We want to know what interventions you did, and we want to tell that story. Thank you, William. Uh, we've got a couple of questions uh, that are similar but different around whether or not people should be selecting partial unsheltered pit count for their type of pit count. So one person says, for the unsheltered count, we asked people everything except for the additional homeless population's questions. Would this be considered a partial pit, unsheltered pit count? Yep. I think the short answer for anything is going to be, is there one element that you're not going to report on? Even if you collect on everything except, um, except HIV status, or there are a few nuanced ones, if it's one, then you're in the partial count. I think it's a great way of thinking about it. This one is, this question is kind of the opposite of that. Uh, this person says, we received a waiver from HUD for the unsheltered count. We ended up doing a modified unsheltered count, but did not cover everything in the same way that we would have in the past. Should we select sheltered count and partial unsheltered count, or should we select sheltered count only? Yeah, I love that question. I suspect there are several communities in that camp. So this depends on how you can answer that partial data question. Are you able to account for the entire, uh, your entire COC with the data you have? If so, I would say, yeah, and you may have to extrapolate to do that. Uh, but if you can confidently extrapolate, yeah, report what you have, right? Like, that's a good thing. The reality is every COC did something slightly different this year. Some of them not slightly, like hugely different, and, uh, and some slightly different, and some no count at all. So if you have data and you're confident it is somewhat reflective of your community, not perfectly reflective, but like, yeah, it gives you a thumbs up, thumbs down. Did we go up, go, go down in our unsheltered? I would uh, encourage you to submit 
the level of that data that you have that you have the most confidence in, right? If, it's, if you collected, uh, you know, a little bit of demographics and a head count, but you're not confident in the demographics, don't report that. But give us the head count uh, so that we have an idea of what's going on with just your total numbers. So you have some flexibility there as well. Uh, I think, again, the one caution is there are some requirements if you did not conduct uh, an unsheltered count in 2020, uh, but you're going to report less than the full amount. Uh, and you didn't get a waiver for that, yeah, we need to talk about that because you actually have more restrictions than others. Uh, there are not very many in that camp, right? For, for the most part, I think we, uh, we heard from everyone and we addressed questions and provided the waivers that are needed, but uh, I'll just put that one caveat. If you did a count in 2020, uh, you have an unsheltered count in 2020, you have like infinite flexibility here. You can choose to report nothing uh, in terms of unsheltered if you want or you can report as much as you have, as long as, again, it's representative of the entire unsheltered population. All right, and one more on, on unsheltered pit counts. This person says, to confirm if a COC only conducted a head count, they will enter the total count number in the all homeless populations totals tab in the total number of persons column. Is that correct? And then we are required to provide an explanation in the notes tab to address the warning that will be triggered. Is my understanding correct? My short answer to that is the HDX, uh, given that I just talked through the HDX slides, is yes, that is absolutely correct. You got it. You nailed it. Thank you. Um, There's someone asking in the HDX, I've noticed on the PIT screen, it is sometimes not saving zero values. I had to go back through and fill in zeros and it dropped them three or four times until they save. Is that normal? Um, I could not see any cause for it and have it in pattern, anything similar. Sometimes I, I've also noticed when testing in the HDX that that does happen. You have to go back and hit zero, fill in the zeros multiple times. Um, if it happens over and over and over again, please open an AAQ so that we can make sure that that is not some kind of bug that we need to be fixing more broadly. Also, the save button, except for when you have first uh, clicked into the HDX, you have to hit save once you pick your type of pit count for it to open the data editing field for you. Um, part of that, I think, is a safeguard so that uh, if you're changing from, I did a full unsheltered count to I didn't do any kind of unsheltered count, it doesn't just delete your data for you. You have to actively click save. But other than that, the save button shouldn't be required to save your data. So again, if you're having issues like it not logging zeros over and over and over again, please submit an AAQ and we will help you uh, sort through that. Um, to clarify, when reporting for VASH in the HIC, are we supposed to report the number of beds based on the number of allocated vouchers and utilization based on the actual number of households based on leased up vouchers, or are we supposed to be reporting something else? Uh, that sounds right, especially if you're using the tool, right? It's like all the data you have essentially is there. Uh, they've exported a certain number of people, certain number, uh, and that may be all you have, right? Number of veterans and some of the underlying uh, demographic data, you're gonna use that to determine how many beds you have, and it'll be people equals beds equals units. So one person to one bed to one unit, and they will be households without children. Great. Uh, and it looks like Lillian has her hand up. Uh, Kayla, would you be able to unmute Lillian, please? Lillian, can you go ahead and say something and see if we can hear you? Sure. Can you hear me? We, we can hear you. Okay. Um, it, it's in the chat, but I, it was kind of a double question. Um, with ESG shelter vouchers, when you did, talked about the SSVF ones, you said use those as overflow beds. Should we do the same thing with ESG vouchers? Uh, it's a great question. You actually have some flexibility there. So there is a lot of the ESG CV funding that actually went into existing shelters, uh, again, to help with decompression. So if you're seeing the inventory you added as a way to supplement decompression, it probably makes sense to report that as year round, and you're likely even keeping that within the shelter, right? But if you're treating it as 
temporary. Uh, you know it's going to go away after COVID, especially if it's temporary emergency shelter. Yes, it seems like you could report them as overflow beds, and that's, that's an appropriate way to go. So you have some flexibility there. You just think about how long you expect those beds to be in the system, and if they're truly going to go away after COVID, which, again, I think many will, overflow is, is a good way to report that. Okay, except that our um, COC is a balance of state, so we use emergency shelter vouchers all the time. Um, and so for during point in time count, should those be regular and so they end up being 100% or should they be overflow? Yeah, so that, again, that's a perfect example of where you as a state, you should you should use your discretion there. Um, okay. We won't we won't force an answer on there because I think actually you, you really should decide because I, I I know I uh, I think this is Alabama is that right Lillian yes uh, you guys have all sorts of flexibility and this is an opportunity that may carry forward and it may make sense to see it as part of your regular system but maybe not all of it so uh, so I I just don't have enough to be able to answer that but I think I'm confident that you uh, you can use your discretion on that and make the call that you think is right for your COC okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. William, we've got a, a kind of a question about both Pitt and HIC here. Our COC was able to capture Pitt count responses from individuals in emergency shelter provided by the correction system and individuals staying in hotels paid for by a charitable organization. To match the pit and the HIC and then later the LSA, will we need to create non HMIS projects? for the corrections, emergency shelter beds, and the motel rooms paid for by this charitable organization. Hmm. I actually wonder, Megan, if you are probably the best one to answer that given the LSA way of thinking, because I'm pretty sure this is actually really an LSA question. Why don't you take a first pass? Sorry, I was reading the chat. Can you uh, say it back again, Aubrey? Sure. So in this COC, it sounds like there is a, an emergency shelter project provided by the correction system, and there's one or multiple hotel motel projects paid for by a charitable organization, and they got pit count responses. So it sounds like they did some kind of pit count survey for individuals who are residing in both of those projects on the night of the pit count. To match the pit to the HIC and later the LSA, will we need to create non HMIS projects? for the corrections, emergency shelter beds, and the hotel motel rooms paid for by charitable organizations. Yes, absolutely put them, you can track them in your HIC as non-participating projects. And, you know, you might want to think too about whether that means that you should also be putting the, the PDDEs into your HMIS as well. If that's, if those projects regularly serve people experiencing homelessness, then even if you don't put any client information in your HMIS, you should probably be tracking uh, the projects themselves. Great, thank you. For VASH, William, if there are vouchers available but not yet assigned, do we mark those as for singles or for families, or do we use a proration? They aren't pre-designated for one population or another. Uh, I would recommend using the proration in that if you have that level of information. Again, if you're using the extrapolation or the, uh, the tool, you probably don't have that, and you can just assume that they're all uh, households without children. Uh, but if you have the household breakdown data with your normal data set, yeah, I would recommend using an extrapolation there. Great. Uh, is VASH required for the 2021 HIC? VASH is always required. So we've required it for several years. Uh, the 2021 context is no different than in the past. And one more clarifying question about VASH and household types. Um, this person says, to clarify, we don't have to report VASH families with children. We only report one bed and one unit per voucher. Uh, we don't have to extrapolate for families, question mark. Yes, that is correct. That's especially if you're using the tool, but uh, you have the option to do that if you would like, but we know that's more work and uh, we are okay 
with you just taking the data directly from the tool that's imported into HMIS and using that. In fact, you may, if you extrapolate, uh, maybe Megan can speak to this, you probably will have question marks that come up on the LSA that says you have this number of people, but I don't see the units associated with them. So, uh, so while you have that option, I would say you're probably smarter just to do the one-for-one -one on the HICS because uh, it'll reflect what's already in HMIS. Does that sound right to you, uh, Megan, with kind of the LSA thinking? It does, yeah. Um, just, even just to be really cognizant about um, where you're putting the household. So if you have families, uh, adults and children households in your HMIS, um, we might have to do a little, we might have some questions when it comes to the LSA, but if it's simplest, just to keep them as adult-only households is fine and keep the one-to-one. -one. Got a question on, is there also a one person per bed expectation for voucher-based hotel shelters or voucher-based permanent supportive housing? So is this kind of premise for HUD-VASH applicable elsewhere or should we also be using the contracted number of beds for either of these other types of projects? If you have a contracted number of beds, and uh, uh, that is definitely what we would prefer, but that also depends a little bit on timing and we kind of want to be um, acknowledge that reality, right? Like if you just got 100 beds, 100 bash beds contracted to you on January 15th, there's no way on earth that they're going to all be leased up, right? So it would be unfair for us to have an expectation that, <laughs> that you would have them all leased up 15 days later. So again, we allow some flexibility. We prefer to have the contracted, but uh, but we allow you that discretion. If that's uh, if you've had the contract numbers for nine months, yeah, you really should actually report that number because we would expect that they should be leased up by then, with probably a low vacancy rate for turnover. Um, uh, so just look at your own local context there. But generally, the answer would be yes. Right. We've got a number of questions of people trying to figure out basically how to determine whether their um, emergency shelters that were funded through COVID should be listed as year-round, seasonal, or overflow beds. Great. Any so, guidance on determining the difference between those three? Yes. Uh, let's start with seasonal. I would say not seasonal. Uh, unless they're like literally uh, replacing like a winter shelter and they're only going to be open during that winter shelter timeline, which actually we do know that some of that happened, but that was pretty rare. Most often the beds were opened and left open indefinitely or at least during the duration of COVID. So I think it would be rare for you to report it as seasonal. Uh, your determination about whether to consider them overflow or year round just depends on how you saw the beds in relation to your existing shelters. So if you treated those beds in hotels as an extension of your decompressed shelters, it seems to make sense that you treat them as year round, right? It's you just moved where people were housed. You didn't change your capacity for housing or sheltering, I should say. Uh, there, I, I think many COCs didn't think of it that way at all. So it's okay for you to say, look, that's really like, we didn't think of it as, is this part of the normal game or not? We just had to reduce what we had in our normal shelters and all of our other options went to COVID and it's all gonna go away when the COVID fund's gone. Uh, so it's okay to say, well, in that case, that's overflow, right? Like that's gonna be available for uh, an indefinite period of, or uh, an undefined period, but it'll end whenever your funding stream ends, which again is not indefinite, won't go forever, uh, it'd probably be over within a year. So it's okay to say, yeah, we're, we actually see those as overflow in our system and we're gonna report them as overflow. Uh, to be honest, I, I would expect most will reflect this inventory as overflow, but we're not, like HUD's not judging, did you put this as overflow or did you put this as, as uh, year round? Like, Again, uh, each system kind of saw their inventory a little different, and it's not for us to kind of make that call for you. Uh, just look at how you look at the beds in relation to your other shelter options. Okay, and um, 
question that I think goes a little bit deeper into how to calculate hotel motel beds than what we've answered so far. So we'll go ahead and dive back into this one. Can you remind me of how to find guidance on calculating beds at hotels? Do we use an extrapolation method? How do we assign unoccupied rooms in hotel projects for the total bed count? Yeah, you're essentially going to use an extrapolation, right? You'll just prorate your data based on the data you have. And again, ideally, you're not going to like just take all your shelter data and extrapolate. You're going to look at uh, the nature of the facilities, right? Like if you were decompressing and really the same population is going to go to the hotel as it's going to the shelter, you, know, you probably should just use your proration based on that shelter or that group of shelters. If it really is a free for all, then that's fine to just use your, like, just look at your total numbers and do an extrapolation there. But the short answer is yes, you should extrapolate and prorate based on uh, some form of data probably your full system data. But again, if you had more targeted ways of allocating uh, people to shelter options, you may want to consider using kind of that subset of shelter data to extrapolate to account for those, uh, those households that went to those types of shelters. Uh, this question, we have a shelter that stopped operating right after COVID and are still not operational now. It has been nine to 10 months. They plan on opening again at some point. Should they be included on the 2021 HIC? No. Say we're serving nobody on the HIC uh, or on the night of the, the account, then no. Again, you'll just have to answer that other normal question around, like, was it decompressed to zero and you literally, like, replaced the same number of beds in a hotel? and your system thinks of it as an extension of that shelter, in that case, you may want to report it as having beds through the hotel. It sounds like you're not thinking about it that way based on how you frame the question. Uh, so I would likely say, uh, no, don't report it at all. It's okay that it was on last year, not this year, and will be on in the future. Um, sifting through the rest of the questions here. Um, there's one that's asking about for a YHDP funded joint component THRRH project, do we select both YHDP and uh, the joint component checkboxes under COC funding? Yes. This should not be mutually exclusive um, terms or funding sources. Um, okay, does HUD have any pre-written talking points to inform our community about how this year's pit count is different and to not fully compare this year's data with previous or future counts? Uh, I don't know about pre-recorded talking points or pre-written uh, talking points. We, when we released the 2020 annual homeless assessment report with the 2020 pit count data. We spoke to it a little bit, certainly in news feeds, we'd spoken to it. Um, it's something we haven't released points partly because we're waiting to see the data and be able to kind of, people have a hard time grappling with it if they don't have something tangible in front of them. But we're happy to kind of talk through that with folks and help shape messaging. We think that's really important and we definitely will we emphasize over and over again, and we have done this with people who fund all of us, right? Like with people on the Hill uh, and others that we've just said, this is not the same set of data. You should not expect, uh, expect to see a comparison. We've actually told them you will not see a national unsheltered comparison. That's simply not going to happen. Uh, we'll compare what makes sense, uh, but we'll caveat it uh, as much as we can. I think the story we have said and for you to think about is the HIC is going to be a really important way to frame the whole response story. So we will put a lot of emphasis on the HIC. This is, again, why it's so important for you to decide what's most reflective of your community and why we don't want to make that call for you. Uh, we're going to take the data as it's given to us and try to tell that story. You should be doing the same thing. Right. If you had, um, I look at California, a lot of project room key in, health in California. I expect most, if not all, TOCs in California will likely want to report those separately and be able to say, this was our project room key intervention. This is what our community did. It was this number of units. They may want to compare that to the number of shelter beds 
from this year to last year and say, yeah, we, we had fewer in our normal shelters, but this was our response to that, to make it safer uh, and to address the, the crisis. So we will have heavy emphasis on the HIC data and virtually no emphasis on the unsheltered, certainly as a national principle, no, uh, no emphasis. And uh, we'll look at what we can tell on the sheltered side. There's certainly a lot of interest in telling the race equity story. If there is a story to be told there, we certainly will analyze that. You should probably do the same, right? We are rightly focusing as a country on the impact of our systems and race. And this is a moment where we can try to tell that story. Uh, but we continue to copy out, right? Like the sheltered data, we're pretty confident in. A lot of it's in HMIS. Uh, and we think that data is pretty strong. We can we can make some analysis there. The unsheltered data, even in normal years, has challenges in the context of the point in time count. So we do make the analysis, but we try to do it with some caution. Uh, if you have unsheltered data, just consider how confident you are in it being representative of your population and perhaps gaps you may uh, have in that data when you present on it. But we think it's a powerful story. And it should, it should be shared. Even if it has holes, it's okay to say, uh, we don't have perfect data on this, but this is what we have. Um, we've got a question. There's someone who said, we were one day outside the last 10 days of January for our pit count. We did not get an official waiver, but we did email Mr. Snow and he told us via email that our pit night was acceptable. Should we say that we received a waiver for our pit count in the HDX? Uh, so I'm the one who actually approves all those waivers. So if it says approved there, uh, then you're approved. I will tell you if you're talking about January 21st, uh, we get flexibility there. There's actually a lot of confusion around like, is this 10 days include January 21st? Does it exclude it? Uh, our goal is not to like penalize people, so, so we tend to allow it, although I would recommend doing uh, January 22nd through the 31st. If you went on February 1st, uh, you can email me again just to verify, and I'm happy, uh, happy to look at that. But if I gave you a confirmation saying it's okay, um, I'm the one who makes that call, so uh, you're probably okay. I would add just from a system perspective, there's probably a validation in the system that um, checks against the date of your count and the validation status or the um, waiver status. So um, just want to send that warning out there. But, so for purposes of the date though, William, an email from you saying that the date that you've chosen is okay, that is the waiver normally, isn't it? Or is there a different waiver process? No, that is the way. Yeah, we don't require anything in paper. We do it all, all via email. Uh, although, I, again, I, I probably dealt with 200 COCs in email, in emails this year. So, like, all of them look a little different and based on the context of the email. So, I'm slightly cautious there. Often, it's a more formal email that says, SNAP sees your request. SNAP has accepted your request. Um, again, if you've emailed me and got a response it's, and that said it's okay, that, that generally is my call. So, you're probably okay. But you can email me again to confirm if you want. Um, we've got someone asking for verification on when PIT count and HIC data are due and whether HUD anticipates offering an extension. Mm, great question. Due May 14th, we don't anticipate an extension. Uh, unfortunately, we have the same restrictions as we have had uh, with like getting it back out to the public, and you saw the 2021 report wasn't released until uh, just a few weeks ago. That actually created some, some problems uh, and impacted other things indirectly for even all of you. So that's, there are like real reasons for us requiring it early. Uh, that being said, like we, we are going to look at uh, requests. We'll take them in context. If you ask for an extension today, the answer will be no. If you ask for an extension on May 7th because you actually, like, there's no way on earth you can do it, we'll look at the context, um, but just recognize there is a chance we will say no, and we don't anticipate at this time extending the deadline. Okay. Uh, going back to something you said earlier, uh, this person has asked, when William stated to report the actual capacity of available beds for a project to avoid complications with LSA, does this mean the actual capacity that is generated by the HMIS HIC report, 
or what the agencies report on bed availability due to, for example, decompression? So, I'm going to answer the way I think it should go. Again, I'll lean on Megan and Aubrey, but the LSA is generally based on your HMIS data. So, the actual based on what's in your LSA is uh, likely the most helpful record in the long term, considering your connection between the PID count, the HIC, and the LSA. Does that sound right? That sounds right to me. Great. Thank you both. All right. We've just got a few minutes left. Um, we'll maybe ask one or possibly two more questions. Uh, one question about ESGCV. Are we to record the beds for ESGCV round two if we do not yet have a contract as of yet? So, to be honest, I don't care about that as like the funding source is less important. If, if you don't have the contract in place, but you are funding the beds, the starting point is absolutely report the beds. Uh, if they're not under contract, uh, I would say no, you probably shouldn't check the funding box. ESG, CV, um, but definitely report the best. Yeah, I think maybe some additional framing on that that might be helpful is usually when we're talking about which beds to include in the HIC, it's more about whether or not those beds are operational, whether or not they could be occupied on the night designated for the count. Yeah. Um, okay, and one other question. We would like to include a new joint component THRH project to the HIC. The TH portion is funded through the joint component program. I assume that means the COC program. Um, and the rapid rehousing funding will come from the ESG program. Since the rapid rehousing funding is coming from ESG, do we need to establish just one rapid rehousing project with two funding sources? Or should two rapid rehousing projects be set up one for the joint component rapid rehousing and one for ESG rapid rehousing. Uh, so my inclination is to think you actually could choose, but this probably makes most sense to treat it as one rapid rehousing project. Um, that's that's just my first take on it. Aubrey, Megan, I think that's consistent with what we said for all of the reporting with joints. Does that sound right to you? The TH and the RRH definitely need to be separated into different projects. In terms of whether there should be one or two rapid rehousing projects um, for that joint component project, I think it's, it honestly should reflect how it's set up in HMIS. So if you're using both funding streams for all clients, then I would imagine that there's one rapid rehousing project in HMIS attached to both of those funding sources. But if for some reason some clients are being uh, served with COC rapid rehousing for that joint component project and some are being served with ESG, then it's probably a little more nuanced and complicated. So work with your HMIS folks and honestly submit an AAQ if there's something super, super nuanced going on there. How does that sound? <laughs> That sounds great. All right. Okay. Well, we are at one minute left, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We've gotten through a ton of questions today, uh, but I know you all probably have a lot more. You can always feel free to submit questions through the Ask a Question desk on the HUD Exchange. Uh, make sure that you submit or you select HDX, Homeless Data Exchange, as your topic on that uh, second page when you're submitting an AAQ. We'll stick the link to that in the chat in just a second. But thank you all for all your hard work. We know that this season is always stressful and that this year it's particularly stressful. Um, so thank you on behalf of the apps team. Uh, and William, do you have any other closing words you wanna offer? No, thanks for all you guys do. Excited to see your questions and get the data in.